Over the break, I had some technical difficulties that didn't allow me to uh, do anything because my laptop is like in the shop right now. Like it's it's pretty bad. So yeah. So this is my wife's laptop. Actually. Yeah, but you look at the desktop. Her desktop is just like covered in stuff. So. So, I hope you guys loved spring break. I I liked it. I like couldn't do work. I didn't have a laptop for like full five, six days of it, and then the other time it was just crashing all the time. So I didn't really have a laptop all break. And like it was really weird because I almost didn't know what to do with myself because um, I do all of my work on my laptop pretty much and half of my play on my laptop. So, so yeah, I read a book, which is, I do that anyways, but I just, yeah, I didn't know what to do. What it was Niles? weird. What? What about Niles? Oh, I played a lot with Niles. Niles, he's, he's just cute as ever. Yeah, just, oh my goodness, so much fun. So yeah, so that's great. Um, yeah, he's really enjoying that the weather is starting to turn a little bit. He used to go outside. He goes crazy outside. I don't really know what what he's doing, but he like he runs around the tree like he's like on an obstacle course, like going for time. And yeah, he's cute. I could talk about him for a while. I realized I hung out with some friends at the night, and I got I was like you know I was at Obsidian downtown, um, which is a cool spot, and I had a drink and we were chatting, and I was like. I whipped out my phone and started showing them pictures of Niles. And I was like, what is happening to me? <laughs> like, I've become that guy who's like showing his friends like at the bar his dog photos. So, yeah. So that's okay. I just have come to accept it. That, that's, that's what I am now. Um, so we did Fourier series stuff before the break and all but one of your homework questions is on Fourier series and not on Fourier transforms. We're going to introduce Fourier transforms today. The very last problem is on Fourier transforms. So I don't think that will be an issue for you guys. Um, yeah, so just don't forget though that homework is due Wednesday. Quiz will be up Wednesday. Please Please uh, start that homework if you haven't already started it over the break. I mean, I'm sure that most of you finished with it. You're two weeks ahead? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jordan. So the Fourier transform, um, I'm pretty much going to introduce two new ideas this week. Um, two big ideas this week, um, the Fourier transform and the Laplace transform. And I think that most of you have probably seen the Laplace transform in a differential equations class. How many of you have seen the Laplace transforms before? Okay, so most of you. And then how about Fourier transforms? Did anybody talk about that? So a few of you. Fourier and Laplace are very similar. Um, so if you have some familiarity with Laplace transforms, the Fourier transform will be very familiar. And then we're going to do Fourier first, and then we'll do Laplace. Um, so this week, uh, we'll do both of them. I actually don't focus on Laplace a lot um, in this class, although I do think that it is a really important idea. I just want to cover so much. Uh, but Fourier and Laplace, we cover both of them. We talk about them, and you guys will have some homework over them. Um, and they're really important ideas that I think uh, everyone who goes through a system dynamics course should be familiar with. 
Although we have introduced a lot of the concepts in this course without the Laplace transform specifically. Um, most system dynamics courses actually start with a Laplace transform, or they at least do it early on. Um, we're just kind of waiting for the end to do it. Um, because we were able to derive things like the transfer function and the frequency response function without the Laplace transform. And most of the time, people use the Laplace transform to define those. So we just did it a different way. There's a little bit of background and sort of where this fits. Um, but we can just get right into the music then. So Fourier transforms um, are related to Fourier series, and uh, we'll, especially conceptually, and we'll talk about that. So aperiodic signals, which are signals that are periodic. No, they're not. They're aperiodic, right? So they're not. They don't, they don't repeat themselves. Okay, so they're aperiodic signals. They don't have Fourier series representations because Fourier series representations are only valid for periodic signals. Um, but they do have a Fourier transform representation. The Fourier transform is derived from considering an infinite number of harmonics, which is equivalent to taking the limit as the period goes to infinity. So if you thought about the Fourier series and all the harmonics that we had, like there's a component at integer multiples of the fundamental frequency, right? Like the square wave, if the square wave repeated once every second, then its fundamental frequency would be 1 hertz, right? And then it would have components at 2 hertz, 3 hertz, etc. hertz. So that's uh, the Fourier series. The Fourier transform says you need an infinite number of those. Um, or, or I guess there might be an infinite number of integer um, values for the Fourier series, but you need an infinitely dense, uh, densely packed spectrum to include all of the frequency components. So you don't just have them at the fundamental frequency and and higher harmonics of it, you just you need to actually have components at all frequencies, potentially. And so uh, we can think of that also as taking the limit as the period goes to infinity. So if you had a periodic function and you said, OK, the period, we, 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 start, the we start the first period and we, just, we never finish the first period. We just like, go off to infinity with that. It just goes on forever. Um, that is another way to conceptually think of it in relation to the Fourier series. Part of the reason we, int we introduced the Fourier series is actually to think about the Fourier transform as a um, sort of a limiting version of the Fourier series. Fourier series is a little bit more intuitive, I think, than the transform. So here are the fundamental equations for the trigonometric form of the Fourier transform representation of a function, y of t. So, um, what just happened there? Boom! Did you guys get all of that? Okay. So, so I hope you were paying attention and got all that down. Um, why? I don't have all my colors programmed into this one, so we're just going to stick with one today. One over two pi. So we're saying we can represent this aperiodic function y of t as this expression, 1 over 2 pi times the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of A of omega, which we haven't defined yet, which we will talk about in a moment, A of omega cosine omega t d t, um, sorry, d omega. Now I have my shortcuts in here, and I can't do things as quickly. d omega plus 1 over 2 pi, another integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of b of omega. We're going to define what um, a and b are in just a moment. Sine omega t d omega again. 
What's after B? Uh, B of omega. B of. That's an omega. Right there. Okay, so that is the expression for uh, how to synthesize. So this is synthesis. Um, a function from essentially an infinite spectrum. A, of a and B are the two components of the spectrum. Now, instead of there being an infinite sum, we have integration, which kind of goes along with the uh, way we've seen this happen before, right? We have um, sums for, for uh, discrete spectrums, and then we have integrals for continuous spectrums. That's something that might be familiar to some of you. Um, and this is uh, an expression that goes along with, there's a, there's a pair um, of equations that it goes along with, where the components, we call A and B the components, the components are A of omega equals the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of y of t. So there's the y of t, or the original function, cosine omega t dt this time. And so there's a, and then b is the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of y of t sine omega t dt. Is anyone bothered by the circularity of this whole thing? It's like y is there, a and b, and then we f define a and b in terms of y. Is that freaking anybody else out? Yeah. Um, and the idea here is that we have the original function y of t, whatever it is. Say it's like some function that comes along and has a peak and then comes down. Like that could be a function, y of t. Uh -huh. So that y of t in the first line equals all that stuff. Yeah. That's, that's not the y of t you're taking your a and b from, right? That's just two different y of t. So essentially what we're saying is this is one representation of a function y of t. So you could take this function here, and you could represent it. Maybe there's some way to represent it using functions like exponentials or something like that, sum of exponentials. Um, but what we're saying is you can also represent it this way, okay? Where if we have another expression for y of t, we could use these to come up with what a and b are. Yeah, you just have to plug in. Yeah, you can't just circularly in plug in this one into these. Yeah. You would have to have another expression for y of t, okay? So this is, so this is over here, we call this um, analysis. So this is called Fourier synthesis, where you use this expression. If you have all the components, A and B, you can write it as this, these integrals. If you have um, a function that has an expression, like this one might be something like, I don't know, e to the t minus t naught uh, minus e to the 2t minus rt, maybe not minus anything. I don't know, something like that. That might be one way to write that function, right? So you could plug that in here for y of t, compute what a and b are for that function. And that would be doing an analysis of this function. 
Um, you can go the other way, and if you have the A and B spectra, the components, then you could compute what Y of T is from those components. So that's how to use the two equations, and it's really not uh, actually, this isn't the form we typically use. So this is the trigonometric form. This is the form that is most directly related to the intuitive version of the Fourier series we defined. Remember, we did the Fourier series in the trigonometric form, where we summed up a bunch of components that were multiplied by cosine and multiplied by sine, right? So we were talking about adding up cosine and sine amplitudes at different frequencies to make a bigger function, compose a function that, is, that contains all of these frequencies, right? That's what we're doing here too, but it's continuous. It's no longer discrete at different frequencies. It's at all frequencies. And that's why we have this integral instead. Don't stress out about it too much. I think it'll become more apparent when we keep doing these uh, examples. Or we're going to do some examples of this. But I want to give you the visualization uh, of the differences and similarities of the Fourier series and transforms in the following way. So Fourier series has a spacing between each of its spectral components, right? And that spacing is, we'll call it delta omega. I did n there for whatever reason. I, I chose that um, to be the, the uh, omega I chose. So 2 pi n over t is what that difference is. Okay. It's, so it's the, the period is related to the frequency, right? And so I essentially, I just stuck that in there. So say 2 pi n over t minus 2 pi n minus 1 over t. So we're saying here's the frequency of 1 of the nth harmonic, and here's the frequency of the one before it. We take the difference, and we find that the difference in frequency is 2 pi over t. Okay? So 2 pi over t is the frequency difference between one component and another component in a Fourier series. Okay? So where t is the period of the time domain function. And that means we've got that. So this, this spacing here in between each one, delta omega n, is listed here. So omega 1 here, so that's the fundamental frequency. And then 2 omega 1, 3 omega 1, these are all of those multiples of the fundamental frequency, right? This is what we did last week, the Fourier series. And these are, um, these could be the, we call them A and B before too. We could, they could be the A or the B, or they could be the, the square root of A squared plus B squared. They have these spectral components that show up. I just wrote some at random here, just to say, here's some <coughs> function that has, so say there's some function and it's got this spectrum in the Fourier series. The Fourier transform, remember, it's like taking the, the period off to infinity, right? And so if we take the period off to infinity of this expression for the spacing in the Fourier series, you see that the spacing goes to zero. And you no longer have these discrete amplitudes like you did in the Fourier series. Now what you have is... Now what you have is a continuous line that will get smoothed out when I let go. Ah. But you have a continuous representation instead. And that's the, the way to sort of think about the Fourier transform is that it has frequency components everywhere. Whereas the Fourier series has frequency components only at these discrete frequencies. Okay? But they're related. Um, they're both representing the function that is uh, uh, composed of a bunch of sinusoids. The Fourier series requires only integer multiples of the fundamental frequency to represent it. The Fourier transform requires, in general, all frequencies to represent it. 
and not just those fundamental multiples. And remember that the Fourier transform uh, applies to aperiodic signals, whereas the Fourier series does not. The Fourier series only applies to periodic functions. So you can't write a Fourier series of a square wave, for instance. Uh, you can't write a Fourier, sorry, a Fourier series of an impulse function. The Fourier series is only for periodic, so the impulse function just is zero everywhere, uh, and then it is infinite spike at zero, and then it's zero otherwise. And that is not periodic, therefore a Fourier series cannot be written for it. But you can write a Fourier transform for it. And that's one of the reasons why we want to write a Fourier transform. Same with a step input. That's also not periodic. We, we like to use step a lot, too. So we, we're going to be using, using this Fourier transform uh, for that type of thing. So it is more common to represent the Fourier transform in complex form. The complex Fourier coefficient, I, I gave that to you guys, huh? Uh, so the Fourier coefficient, instead of needing a and b, you have one complex amplitude y, okay, capital Y. And if you want to relate a and b to y, a is the real part, b is the imaginary part. So they're very closely related. Um, and this gives rise to the Fourier transform pair, where you have y of omega, so if you want to compute the the amplitude, so this is the synthesis part. Oh, sorry, this is the analysis part. I switched to one. This is the analysis part. Analysis. This one here is the synthesis. And this tells you how to go to a complex amplitude given a time domain y of t. This tells you how to go from a complex amplitude to a time domain function. So this is how we think about the Fourier transform. If you have a function in the time domain, y of t, and you want to know what this function, how this function could be represented in the frequency domain, we take the Fourier transform of it to get y of omega, okay? And that's this first equation here. That's the analysis. If you have a function that is in the frequency domain, if you have the complex amplitude, y of omega, and you want to know what it would be in the time domain, you take the inverse Fourier transform. And that's the second equation. Okay. The Fourier transform is more useful than the Fourier series. They're conceptually very related, and the concepts that apply to the Fourier series um, slide nicely into the Fourier transform. But the Fourier transform is more powerful in the sense that we can do more with it. Fourier series, like we could write down a bunch of you know uh, components that made it up. So we would say, oh, here's a spectrum. Probably the most useful thing you can do with it is write a spectrum for a, for a uh, periodic function. But the Fourier transform actually lets us solve problems a little bit easier. The Fourier transform, our Fourier series did allow us, remember we could do that, um, we could solve for the steady state response of a system using the transfer function or using the frequency response function. Right in the Fourier series, so that was cool. Periodic signal, any periodic signal we could find the solution for, that was cool. Um, Fourier transform allows us to do that for a much broader class of systems, which is cool. Uh, it can be used to characterize the response of systems and solve differential equations, which is probably what you guys were using Laplace transforms to do, right? Fourier transforms are 
you can do something very similar to how you, you, you solve a Laplace transform differential equation. Um, for that method, it's, it's almost exactly the same as the Fourier series, or the Fourier transform method. So perhaps most useful, though, is the idea that each time domain signal, y of t, has an equivalent frequency domain representation, y of omega. That's like conceptually the most important thing. We knew how to do that for periodic signals with the 4A series. Now we can do that with aperiodic signals as well. So now we can do that for any, any signal. We can not only look at it in the time domain, like we're used to, we can also look at it in the frequency domain, like we're not used to. So, I, I'm going to use this little representation here to explain um, how you could use this for a, we're going to do it in a moment, talk about some properties, and then we're going to do an example uh, of the Fourier transform. But first I want to talk about um, this, and I'm hoping to reach back into your memory for Fourier, or for Laplace transforms, and remind you how you used them. So you would have something in the time domain, like a differential equation in the time domain that was written out, like some time constant times y prime plus y equals some input. Okay, So that was a first order differential equation. You would Laplace transform the whole thing. Remember that? Laplace transform the whole thing. And then you would solve for the output algebraically. Because when you take the Laplace transform of the equation, you get an algebraic equation instead of a differential equation. So you can solve for the Laplace transform of your output which is nice, algebraically. And then you had to inverse Laplace transform to get out the solution in the time domain. You remember that? You can do exactly the same thing with a Fourier transform. You can take a differential equation, Fourier transform it, solve algebraically for y, um, and uh, you have some expression. You take the inverse Fourier transform to get the solution. So you, you can do this, and it doesn't have to be solving a differential equation. You could do this for solving for anything in a, an equation, but that's most commonly used in the differential equation. So that, this little loop here is supposed to represent that. So Fourier transform, solve for what you want, then inverse Fourier transform. That's one common route to go. Um, Laplace, again, we're going to do the same thing. I actually I don't know, we'll see. I've been flirting with the idea of not introducing Laplace because like, I think everyone here has seen it before. You're all supposed to have seen it before. Um, and just doing an example of a Laplace transform thing instead because I feel like it might be more useful. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. That's for Wednesday or Friday. So let's look at this transform table from the resources here. So. We've got under resources, we've got Fourier transform table. Um, this has a page on properties of the Fourier transform. Um, and it also has, uh, well, so some of them are properties, some of them are just Fourier transforms that they've worked out, a table of them. Does this seem familiar from the, your Laplace transform days? Um, you guys probably saw a table. And that was like a bunch of properties, and also it was a bunch of Fourier or Laplace transforms that were already done for you. So you can go from one to the other, or back and forth. So this becomes this exercise in arranging things to look like the table and then using the table, right? Which yeah. is a good thing to be able to do. Um, so in the following, the functions are periodic with period t. A is a constant greater than 0. 
um, b t zero and omega naught uh, are real constants, and n is an integer. So here is the time domain on the left hand side, and here is the frequency domain on the right hand side. So this is the the linearity. Um, identity here where if you have if you scale something in the time domain by like a1 some constant it scales in the frequency domain if you add things in the time domain they add in the frequency domain or so they add the frequency domain so it's that's nice um, if you have if you scale the time variable this is what you have to do the frequency domain okay so it's a sort of inverse scaling, but you also scale omega as well. Um, if you reverse time, it reverses the frequency. Um, if you shift in time, you have this multiplication by an exponential in the frequency domain. These are all very similar to the Laplace transform ones. They're ones that are analogous in the Laplace transform as well. So there are a bunch of these properties here. Um, notice that so there's one in particular that we're going to be interested in. If you take the derivative, the time derivative, and the time domain, which if you have a differential equation, this comes up, right? <laughs> then in the frequency domain, it's just j omega times the Fourier transform of the function. So f of omega is a Fourier transform of the function. So equivalent to taking the derivative in the time domain, you just multiply by j omega. What is it in Laplace? transforms. It's just s times the Laplace transform. So this is the same thing except for s equals j omega. So that actually holds true for all of these things. Um, if you take the nth derivative, it's just j omega to the nth power times the Fourier transform. So uh, you continue. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, and yeah, uh, let's see. Where's the one? There's, there should be one here that is for a unit step function. Aha. Is it this one? Let's see, where's you? So the Fourier transform of the uh, Dirac delta function, the impulse function, is just 1. Um, the, that is not the unit step function, I don't think. Ah, there we go. There's the unit step function. 1 is just 2 pi delta of omega. So there's the, free, there's the Fourier transform of that. Um, we've got a uh, something like a ramp happening here. So there's just like, there's a, there's a bunch of them. And here are some other properties. So I always come back to this if I have to do one because it's a nice table. Um, the textbook has a smaller table of them, but I recommend using this table if it's a little bit more thorough. Now, we're just going to take a Fourier transform using the definition now, and then uh, we're also using, going to use a table. So we'll do both. The first, uh, so what is the Fourier transform of this? So it's 0 for all time less than 0, and it's k e to the negative a t for all time greater than 0. So it looks like this, right? 0 at time equals 0, it's just k, and it decays down. So we want to know what the Fourier transform is of that. So let's do the definition first, um, because I think that's good to do at least once, right? Technically, you know, you guys could just use the definition always and not have to use the table at all. Just Always integrate, right? Your calculus teacher would be proud. So 
from the definition, if we want to know what the Fourier transform is of this, we have to integrate from negative infinity to positive infinity of the function f of t e to the negative j omega t dt. So we're doing analysis. And we happen to be integrating over a function that is 0 for all time less than 0, right? So we can integrate from 0 to infinity, because the integral of 0 is always 0, because we're integrating 0 times something, so it's going to be 0. Uh, of what is f of t for time greater than or equal to 0? k e to the negative a t, right? Uh, and then we still have this e to the negative j omega t dt. OK. We could pull out the constant k, and we could combine the exponential. So it's going to be e to the negative a plus j omega, all of that times t, dt. And what is your method that you're going to choose to integrate this? <clears throat> U substitution. That's what I would do. Um, so what is u equal to? A plus j omega. Yeah, uh, I'm going to just make it negative a plus j omega t. Um, so if you take du, that's equal to negative a plus j omega dt, right? So if you solve this for dt, you get du divided by negative a plus j omega. And so we can plug in for dt. And we can take this denominator. It's a constant, right? We can take it out here with the k. So k over. Now I'll put the negative sign up top, a plus j omega times the integral. Um, we should also, I mean, we have to change the uh, limits of integration too, right? So at time equals 0, what is u? 0. And at time goes to infinity, It actually goes to negative infinity. So this is eu du. And what is the integral of e to the x? E to the x. Yeah. So that's nice. <laughs> and so we can say e to the u evaluated from 0 to negative infinity. And if we plug in negative infinity here, that goes to 0, right? e to the negative infinity is 0. Anything to the negative infinity is going to be 0. Because it's going to be 1 over e to the infinity, which is really, really big. So it's super big. Um, and then we're going to have the minus e to the 0, which is 1. So the negative signs cancel, and we get k divided by a plus j omega. And this is the answer.
our answer. So, hopefully the table will agree with us. Yeah. Sorry, uh, that's the Fourier transform? Or what is it? Fourier transform, yeah. Just the Fourier transform of this function that we define. And just so happens that our trusty table also has this defined. So let's look that up. So if we look through here, well, anything multiplied by e to the j omega has this shift in frequency. So that might relate to what we're doing, but let's see if there's anything that's closer. Um, we just keep scrolling. Aha! E to the minus AT times the unit step. So we usually use U subscript S for unit step. That's what we've got, isn't it? I mean, we've got zero and then we go it's not actually the units it's not times the unit step it's times the unit step times some constant right because we have this constant k so it's not exactly but it's close so let's use this property here first that'll tell us that the Fourier transform of part of our function is this 1 over j omega plus a. So, so from the table, e to the negative a t times the unit step transforms to 1 over a plus j omega, right? We have a scaling of this, right? We have a scaling of that. So we need to see what happens when things scale. And that we learned from up here, right? If you multiply something by a constant, some time domain function by a constant, you multiply the frequency domain by a constant. Fourier transform it by a constant. Same constant. So we know that k times some function g of t in the time domain transforms to that same k times the Fourier transform of g, so g of omega. So you could either you could either write this as k g of omega or it's so it's standard to write the Fourier transform as capitalized version of the function. So if it's lowercase g of t, it's capital G of omega. But we, this is also just the Fourier transform of g of t, right? We just shorthand write that as g of omega, big G. So what do these two properties tell us? Yeah, exactly. So we get k divided by a plus j omega. And that is our answer. So that's how to use the table. Obviously, it's a little easier than integrating. I don't know about you guys, but when I'm given the opportunity to have somebody else integrate something for me, I take it. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that's how to do the Fourier transform. That's what the Fourier transform is. That's how to compute a Fourier transform. And that will help you with your homework. You should be able to do all your homework now. The last problem is the only one you will need this for. Um, yeah, so welcome back. I did, I graded all your tests, obviously. I actually almost got same day service, um, but I didn't quite finish all of them. Um, so I was gonna make a joke about it 
that night on Slack, like, same day service, like so amazing, and then I didn't get it all done. <laughs> so, anyways, they're graded. I think you guys did well. Uh, I was proud of you guys. Uh, and I'll get them back to you on Wednesday. And